Well, hello again, everyone. Um, welcome again to another OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm really pleased to be redoing this demo um, with Don Schenk. Uh, we tried this once before and the demo gods were not with us. So this is a redo. Um, we're going to be talking about .NET Core, microservices, and running all that good stuff on OpenShift. So I'm going to let Don take it away. The way we do these is um, you can ask questions in the chat. If it's something door stopping or uh, show stopping rather, we'll interrupt him. But otherwise, we're going to let him flow through his demo and his presentation and have Q&A at the end. Um, but you're welcome to ask questions in the chat. There's a number of us um, who might be able to answer. Um, and then Don can correct us at the end um, if we misspoke. So anyways, go ahead, Don. Take it away. Let's see if the demo gods have been appeased. I was praying. Okay. Great. Thank you. So somewhat wise person or crazy person once said, when you're handed lemons, make lemonade. So that's what I did since the last uh, attempt at this. The goodness that came out of it was now the source code for this demo is not only in a repository. If you see there, there are two branches. There's master, which is the current version of .NET tooling. And then there's version one tooling. So if you go and install .NET Core through the proper channels of Red Hat, you will be using the version one tooling. I'm going ahead because of reasons I have to, to the to the newer version. The source code is the same. The only difference is the way it's built. So nothing breaks that way. And when you go from version one to 1.1, it's .NET migrate and you're done. But I just wanted to show you now that we do have two versions of this and, and this will this will continue this versioning on uh, the GitHub repo. So here's a description, you've seen this. We're talking about a transition in the software industry. And as you see, moving from left to right, top to bottom, from waterfall to DevOps, from monolith to microservices, from physical servers, which we all I'm sure remember, to virtual servers and containers, and then of course the cloud. We, we're, we are all at different parts of this grid, if you will. The ideal being at the bottom and staying at the bottom, which is the top of our game. A little play on words there. So let's talk about some of the technologies in play in this demo. Linux containers, Kubernetes, OpenShift. This is the buzzword slide, if you will. Zero downtime deployments, including blue, green, and canary. And then the circuit breaker pattern, uh, which is of great value, not just for microservices, but this is something you can use today. So just some of the issues that we're dealing with and want to address, deploying software just takes too long. It can take hours, weeks, months to roll out new versions. Um, I recently gave this demo and I said it can take several months and most of the room nodded their head in approval. Um, so I, <laughs> we all know that. Software is too complex. This is an arguable point in that microservices can reduce that complexity. There can be complexity in the network. Um, so you might be replacing complexity in code with complexity in network. But the idea is that each individual piece of software is very simple. I recently heard a talk by the founder of Wonderlist, which is a to-do list that was purchased by Microsoft and they use a series of microservices. And he said, you know, it's a to-do list. But the point was, he said, every microservice is so simple and they're written in all kinds of any language you can think of. And that you can look at the code, not knowing the language and understand what it does. And he gave the example of a service went down and it was written in Haskell and the person looked at it, didn't know Haskell. So they rewrote it in Python or whatever. They literally just rewrote it in their language because the, the service was that small that they could do it. So that's where the software complexity is reduced at that level. And then the third thing, it takes forever to scale up or down. Even if you use VMs, it can take forever. Of course, we're spoiled, can be minutes. But when you need to scale, you need to scale now. So what we're gonna do today, we're gonna do the, uh, the, the evolution of running on my PC and then running it in a Linux container, <clears throat> which is uh, a lot of people, I think, want to stop there. 
but we're going to go on and there's a, an important reason why to run it in OpenShift, which is a platform as a service. And there's, there's, there's a couple of huge benefits here, huge benefits that should not be understated. Then we're going to do some, then we will do some zero downtime deployments using OpenShift. And that is something that can benefit you immediately. And then the circuit breaker pattern, which again, there is something you can use now. And that circuit breaker is just one part of microservices uh, distributed processing, if you will. It's just something I want to bring up to show you that, hey, there are some changes when you deal with distributed processing microservices, some of which you can use now, some of which you won't. Uh, probably most of them you will. And they all come from the idea of what's called the 12 factor app, which if you're not familiar with that, I would just say go ahead and uh, bing it instead of <clears throat> Google it. So I'm, I'm going to start by going over here to my OpenShift console, which I've logged into, and just show you I have a sample project there, nothing major going on there. And I'm going to create a project at the command line. So the first thing I need to do is log in. OpenShift dev account, it, it comes built in uh, with OpenShift. So everything we do here today, you can download the Red Hat development suite and get started and do it immediately. The, the, re the repo has instructions. I mean, this is something you can replicate later today if you want. So I, I'm, I'm logged in to a new project and I'm going to call it my.net. It's, it's what's cool to me as a dot net or as I'm doing all these things in Linux and OpenShift and Kubernetes and Docker and I'm in my comfort zone of C sharp and F sharp. So I, I'm not it, 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 it never stops blowing my mind the fact that I'm doing everything in dot net. So I'm in my directory for my repo. I have code here and the first thing I want to do is just <clears throat> dot net run and just to run the code you know, this is, would be the evolution, right? It runs on my PC, uh, which is typically, isn't that where Friday at 4.30, isn't that when you deploy it? <laughs> Sorry. So if I go over to my browser and look at port 5000, which is where this is running, and the IP address is the IP address of my virtual machine. By the way, I'm running this. This is a Linux VM running in Windows on a Mac. So we've basically done everything we can to break this or <laughs> show you that it all works together. And it does in fact work together. So what it does, it outputs the name of the, the host, which in this case is the VM, right? The RHEL CDK. So this just proves to you that it's running um, and I'm accessing it outside the VM within my Windows host machine. So, okay, that's working, that's great. So let's take that and shut it down. Notice if you're new to .NET in in Linux, you're not using IIS. You're running things from a command line. There's a an HTTP server called Kestrel. It's it's very fast. It's not full featured. It's not outward facing. Uh, in, in other words, you want to put it behind Apache or Nginx. Uh, Microsoft, I've read and heard them say that they are working on improving that. But for now, you'll just run it behind again Apache or Nginx, and it works great. But it's command line, so there's a shift right there. Okay, so that's so that's working. So the next thing we need to do is we need to do a, a build, and we're going to call it um, we'll go .NET Hello. <clears throat> so we, we're going to do a Docker build. If you're not familiar with Docker and how it works, it's a, think of it as a real tiny VM. I don't know how else to explain it without going into a lot of detail, but it's it's a, it's an image that is, is, is small and compact and it has everything it needs, the operating system, all the, the dependencies, uh, basically it's just ready to roll. It's, it's just like if you had a server all configured and you press the button and it took off and ran, which is interesting because when you go to, how many people now in, in an enterprise environment could go to a server, <clears throat> whether it's physical or virtual, and say, I'm gonna replicate this uh, exactly 100%. It, that's a tough one. It shouldn't be, uh, but it is. It is. It's a fact, and that's, we just need to understand that. So I've gone ahead and created it. The image. So if I do a, a list of images, you'll see it right up here at the top. 
So there's the Docker image, it's 287 megabytes. Now an image becomes a, runs in and becomes a container. So that's the Docker run command. And so I have to, um, I'm running it detached. You can run it interactively, but we don't want to do that. It runs on port 5000. I'm going to give it a name because if you, if you don't, it, it, it kind of funny, it assigns a name and it's one of these things where it, it it's a uh, adjective underscore person like silly Einstein or something like that. So now it's running. You saw how quickly that started. I mean, just like that, you have this program running and it's running in Docker. And if I do a Docker PS to show all the processes, I should see it up at the top. There it is. It's been up for 14 seconds. Uh, another neat thing. I, um, if I do Docker logs and then the .NET hello, and you can tab complete, I can see the logs. So if we ran at the command line, you said, you know, control C to shut down. Now you just saw the logs that verify it's doing the same thing inside of Docker. So now I go over here to my website. And when I refresh this, I should get the same thing except for this. And let's see what happens. Refresh it. And there it is, 20B211. If you keep that in mind, because if you go back here to the command line, when I started it, to see the, the ID that came up, <clears throat> so it's putting like the first 10 or 12 characters uh, when it outputs it. But so what I'm seeing here is that the container is functioning exactly the same way as it was from the command line. And the difference being the host name, which I want, right? I'm, that's part of my code to show you the name of the host. So now I have it running in Docker. <clears throat> well, that's great. That's fine. It's running on port 5000. There's a couple of issues here though. One of which is what if I run another application on the same port and I get a, you would get a collision. How do I scale this? How do I deploy this and, and update it? And that's where uh, OpenShift really shines and Kubernetes working together. So the first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna stop this. Um, I know the name, so I can just stop it. And I, I'm gonna remove it just for reasons of uh, clogging up, you know, taking space. So now I'm at a command line and I'm ready to go and show you the power of OpenShift. So here's, here's the project I created from the command line reflected in my dashboard. And when I click on it, there's nothing there, which is understandable. Over here, I have a PowerShell window and it, it will watch. Uh, well, let me just show you what it does. So if I do a watch the, the um, OpenShift, you'll see that it just, it basically does a, a curl command in PowerShell and then sleeps for a second. So if I, if I, let me fire that up and I should see service not available because it's not. That, that's a bit of a problem, right? What you're seeing right there, because every time it does that, it's hitting the server. Of course, right now it's not a problem because the, you know, it's just one of them. But what if I was trying to spin this up and there was tens of thousands or hundreds or millions of people hitting it? Think what that would do to my server. We'll talk about how to get around that a little later. And it's a really neat feature. So we go back to the command line and I have a bunch of scripts. So the first thing I'm going to do is run create green one. And that's going to create uh, a build and put it into OpenShift. And what I'm doing here at this point is I'm going down here to show you what I, what's called the blue-green deployment. <laughs> Sorry about that. So basically a blue-green deployment, it, and it's not A-B testing. Blue-green deployment says, and it's just two colors arbitrarily picked by someone. If I'm running on green and I want to switch, immediately to blue. Or if I'm running on blue, I'm gonna switch immediately to green. That is to say you might have version one running and you want the option to immediately go to version two with no downtime. And let's say something happens, you've tested it, you've done everything right, but somehow something falls through the cracks and version two isn't working right. You can immediately go back to version one. That's the beauty of the blue-green deployment. It, and it's, a, it's an all or nothing switch, which is important to know because a little later we'll talk about a, a partial switch. But this is the this is the uh, this is the beauty of Kubernetes and OpenShift and containers all working together. 
So on my command line, I'm going to go ahead and run this. And when I go over to here, you're going to start to see some goodness. If I can get this to stay in the background, get my screen right. Let me go over here and show you what the what the uh, script looks like. It's only four lines of code, as you can see. So what it does, it, it uh, actually three. <laughs> it, it creates a build in OpenShift, which is it's a build configuration. Basically says this is what we're going to do. And in our case, it's a binary build. That's important to know because you can also build from source. You could have a merged pull request on GitHub fire off a build. That's nice. Then we start the build, and there's an option here that says follow, and that just says show us what you're doing. <clears throat> and then we create a new app. At that point, we have .NET Hello app up and running, and here it is. We can see it. It's done. It's up and running. Now, there is an issue here is that we cannot get to it. So I have to create a a route, a uh, a URI, if you will. So I'm going to, in the parlance of OpenShift, expose the service, and I'm going to assign a host name. You don't have to, but I'm going to because I want to show the flexibility that you can do this. You don't have to go with the what it assigns, and I'm going to assign it to the service .NET Hello. Before I mash enter here, up here in this corner, if you can see my cursor, where it says create route, it's replaced with a, your, that quickly. And if I click on that, boom. So now I have version one of my application running in OpenShift. Now I'm where I want to be. You see the name of the host is reflected in .NET hello dash one twenty one f And over here, my PowerShell application, ah, it springs to life. It sees my application now running in OpenShift. One of the benefits you have of OpenShift and Kubernetes together right now is what's called service discovery. And that is, I don't need to know IP addresses. I don't have to write some kind of script to go and find it or assign them or what have you. I can write my code to look for the URI. Remember the host name I assigned? Well, that's in my PowerShell script. So when, I, when that comes available, it, everything comes to life. It's discovered. I don't have to do all these crazy things to find it. That's not a small thing. It really is not. Now that that's running, I can go over to, to OpenShift, and I can say, give me two of them. And if you watch in the background, well, let me go here. See, boom, it's done. Now I have two, and see the different names, the V47 and the 21F. So now we're talking about scaling. Now I have two. Now my traffic goes up. I have three, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. In four seconds, I have three of them running. And this isn't on a laptop. This isn't even a server. So as you can see, now we start getting into, oh, this is great. I wonder if you could do this with a legacy application. You can. We'll talk about that later, which is fantastic. So now we have three pods. I'll scale back to one just to save some CPU cycles. <clears throat> and it's it's my my green application. Remember I ran create green. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna change my code here just to uh, further the impact. I'm gonna go from green and the go to blue. So now I've changed my source code, so I need to uh, rebuild it. So I have a publish, a publish, um, it, a build script that takes the .NET code and publishes it into a directory that I can then build from and put into an image. Over here on my, oh, I was in the wrong, it doesn't matter. So there I have it built. So um, now I can do a, uh, let me show you. I had create green first. Now I have create blue. And that's the second version, if you will. So when I hit this, it should go ahead and take the bits that I just compiled, which you remember I changed it to version two, and should go over here and, and, re and not replace the one I have but create another instance, there you go, .NET Blue running within 
open shift. And then I switch. Now, if you see in the background PowerShell, did you see that service not available? Again, what is that all about? How do we get around that? That's that's we're gonna see that too. <clears throat> and uh, so I have some uh, caching problems going on here, but it, as you can see, the it, it is the new version because it says blue, the host name. <clears throat> I didn't. Uh, apparently, .NET builds don't always replace all the bits unless you clear out the the cache first. That's okay. We have the blue running. And the regular one, and if I and the green one, and if I switch back, I have a script switch to green, and it immediately switches to green. Let me restart this because this there we go. So there's the green. Sometimes PowerShell likes to get hung up on me. And if I go switch to blue, I want you to watch the PowerShell screen when I hit enter. Boom, it's an immediate change. So that's how you would go with the blue green. So I uh, got version one, it's working fine. I switch to version two. Uh oh, I have a problem. I need to go back. Boom, I go back. So that's the blue green. And this, the scaling here, if you have three scaled up of each, it's going to switch from three to three. In other words, you're not going to lose your scaling, so to speak. All you're doing is changing basically the route to point from one app, one service to another. So that's the blue-green deployment, uh, which is, again, made possible by the use of Kubernetes and OpenShift. That's something that if you were just using Docker, that would be, I don't know how you would even do it without writing your own, basically. And it's also, uh, if you're just deploying apps the old way, I don't even know how you would even come close to this, particularly the speed of it. So now let's talk about the Canary deployment. This one's pretty neat because it's the, the canary in the coal mine, if you've ever heard that phrase, where you take a canary into a coal mine, and if any gas, um, carbon monoxide or natural gas, um, this is a public service announcement, natural gas has no odor. That's why they add it, right? But if they didn't, think about that, how it's deadly. So the canary deployment says we're going to take the next version, and we're going to deploy it to some of our users. We're pretty, I mean, we tested it. We know it works, um, but we all know everything always works, right? But it somehow it doesn't. But let's say it does. Okay, well, we gave it to 25% of our users. Let's go to 50%. You just kind of slowly roll it out to some. And if anything goes wrong, you can back off quickly. And when things go right, you can move forward quickly. At the same time, never losing your original application. So again, it's like as blue green was boom, 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 real quick. Canary is also the the speed at which you progress is your call, so to speak. You know, if you want to run 25% of users for a week and then scale it up to half or all, whatever, it's up to you. But the beauty, again, is it supports it. So basically you have development. Here's my application moving through development, right? And everything works out there. That's great. Of course, you know how that is. It runs on my PC, it's ready. Well, it's not. So we go to QA. QA looks at it, runs it, tests and everything. That's fine. And by the way, this can all be automated. A lot of this can be automated by using Jenkins, which is a whole nother uh, subject. And then it goes into staging. We're ready to go, ready to go. Okay, okay. Let's roll it out into production. And if you see here, I have a, you know, I had my load balancer and out to my users and it's pointing to the blue one. So I put it out in production to some users. And if that's successful, there we go. Now, okay, now we have it connected, so to speak, to the users, and they're hitting it, some of them. That's working well. We're going to give it to some more users. We're going to give it to some more users. Hey, everything's working real well. No, no, no. We better back off. Or No, no, it's going well. Okay, we go out. And next thing you know, everyone has access to it. That's the, that's the diagram of the Canary deployment. Let's go and actually do it, shall we? So over here in Windows, I'm going to watch Canary. And over here, I'm going to do my favorite part of the whole demo and destroy everything and start over. So OC, delete. Yeah. So I, I'm going to delete. And this is just to show you, um, if you're a developer, 
right? And you're and you're developing and you're using this on your PC. There comes times where you know how it is. You just like I need to start over, and it's boom, done. And you see in the background, everything's just gonna boop, go away. So that's the that's another neat thing about using all that. You don't have to like, oh my gosh, I have to tear down all this stuff or repave my machine or anything silly. I just typed a command and wiped out all my stuff. Now I still have my source code. I still have my binary stuff on my machine. Don't get me wrong, but uh, now we're ready to do it again. So OC new project. And I'll just call it my .NET again to keep it simple. In the background, if I go here, there's my .NET and there's nothing in it. So now I'm going to create a service. It's called .NET first. Um, and I apologize, I need to name change the name to like .NET Canary just to make it simpler, more understandable. But as you see here, I have uh, Canary create one. So I'll run Canary. And at this point, it's fair for you to say, well, yeah, Don, you have all this stuff, uh, you know, you have it all scripted. That's that's all well and good. But when, you know, when I'm developing stuff, I don't have that luxury. And, you know, it seems like, well, it's unfair. You scripted everything. Of course it works. But that's part of DevOps is that we do that, right? That this is where the shift we want to make from just typing commands of, you know, and then another command, another command, another command to just running a script. Um, and so think about it. Once you have scripts written, then you can start automating those and things can be kicked off by like checking in source code or timers or what have you. So it's not cheating. It's where we want to be. I know we're not everyone, but this is where we want to be. So here's here's my application running as the canary. All right. It's fired up now. There's the pod. I'm going to go with four of them. And I'm going to take my startup code. See, it didn't. So you see here in the code, it's it's uncommented. And you saw last time when I did the build. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to remove the object library uh, directory and the bin directory and give you a little uh, inside baseball here. So now it's a little .NET restore to pour everything down because I just blew it all away. So if you're not into .NET, this is this is a and npm has what yarn is that the new one? Uh, this is your basically your package manager. I'm pulling down, so I, I restored everything I need for it, and now I can do a .NET. I can I can build it. Here's the build. By the way, if you see this build, this is the newest version of .NET that uses the Microsoft build engine. The previous one used a different build engine. That was the change from .NET tooling version 1.0 splat to version 1.1. Again, the underlying source code's all the same. Um, and unfortunately, we went from JSON to XML, but oh well. So there's my output. Now I have this ready to go and I can do the canary create too. And what that's going to do is create, it should be version two. <laughs> of this application and start it up. So if you want to see what that is, Canary create two, what happens here is you, you create a build, right? And you, you, you build it, but then you, you start, I don't want to say messing around, but you, you manipulate the, uh, the application, it's uh, path to it and the metadata, and you use that to your advantage where you put labels in that you can identify, you know, that you assign, and then you can ma manipulate the uh, the route and things like that. So that's what's happening. Again, the service not available in the background. What's that all about? We need to address that. We'll come up with a great way to address that. So scaled everything back. Now it's scaling it up, and you're going to see in the background come to life. And what we should have is four versions on the top, four pods, if you will, the first one. And one of the second. And when once that goes to four, I'm going to scale it back to three immediately. Okay, again, this is running on a laptop. This is not a server, but you still get an idea of it's it's pretty quick. I mean, this is just running on a little laptop. So now I have three and one. So I should see three of the .NET Hello first for each of, and then one .NET Hello first canary. So that would be the canary. And in the background, if you watch, there you see it. 
So now I'm in a position, and you see the version two and the version one. Now I'm in a position where I can manipulate who gets it. Now, it's important to note that this isn't going to control who gets it. This just controls the scaling. But think about it. If you 25% of your customers are hitting your website and you want to give it to 50%, you're probably going to adjust your scaling accordingly, right? I mean, that just makes sense. So I will scale this one up, and I'm going to wait for it to come up. And so so I'll have a little overlap, which nobody's going to complain about that, right? And then I'm going to scale that one down. Now I should have a 50-50 mix. And as you see, first and canary. So now I have 50-50. And it, it just goes on like that, uh, you know, ad infinitum, so to speak. If I scale this to four, and oh, by the way, the, all the scaling you can do at the command line, or you can you can set thresholds and triggers to do it automatically. So you don't you don't you're not sitting here at a screen doing these things. And now I'm I'm completely the canary is flying through the the coal mine, if you will. Everything's great. So that's the canary uh, deployment made possible by OpenShift and Kubernetes and containers. This is, I, this is something that would be really difficult otherwise. So now I'm gonna talk about the circuit breaker pattern. Because remember we saw that like, well, the service is down and what's that all about? Well, this is one way to address that. And, and this is a best practice in distributed computing. So circuit breaker pattern is kind of like, you know, electricity, you know, right? Your circuit's closed and everything works. And then you, you know, you spill water on a, or you get water in your outside stuff and it breaks the circuit. Um, so here, it's the open, you're not even reaching the server. You can't reach it. And the closed one, the server is working. Now, the, the fact is, the closed one, in reality, the server could be working, but let's say really slow. So let's think about that scenario where you're hitting a server that's down for some reason, or, or not down, but the, the application isn't functioning right. And it's very slow. Let's say it's overloaded. Well, if if all your clients keep hitting it, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? You're saying you're saying this thing is overloaded, so let's just keep hammering it till we get what we want. And that's not really going to work. What you want to do is you want to back off and say, hey, let's give it a, a rest here. So here's a little state transition diagram of the circuit breaker pattern. So and it, it sounds counterintuitive to me that closed and open, but closed is the good one, right? And open is the not great one. So when it's closed, you're reaching the server. Everything is honky-dory. Everything's fine. But when it's closed and you have a failure, whether it can't reach the server or it times out, and these and that condition is defined by you in code, when you have a failure, the circuit goes to open. And then it stays open for the a, a certain amount of time and or attempts. Again, these are all configurable by you. And as you see, when the wait time is reached, we go to half open, which says, all right, we think we're ready to try now. We're going to make one attempt to reach the server. And if we have success, we're like, okay, everything's fine. We're good. But if you don't have success, it fails, and you go back to the open state until, again, your wait time. In, in, in this demo, I think I have four attempts for the failure and eight seconds for the wait time. Um, but that's not – that's the, the numbers aren't important. The concept is. And everything in the orange box, you are not even attempting to reach the server. You're not even attempting, which is great because now the server gets a rest. No pun intended. And what you can do on the client side – is you can say, okay, if the circuit is open and I'm not reaching the server, I can have some kind of fallback position, a default value, a default action that I take. So it allows you to graciously handle failures. And the reason this is important, because you can do this today in your existing applications. You don't need to be using containers. If you have a website or a mobile app or whatever that, that, that reaches a server and a service, and you have this problem can present itself, you can implement this now. You don't have to wait. This is a best practice in distributed services. Think about it. If you have 200 microservices and they're all talking to each other, 
the last thing you want is 199 of them flying and the one holding them all up. That's what you want to avoid. That's what this is really all about. So I have a cool little application called Howdy. And what, so you, if you, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, I have Howdy and Bonjour and Aloha. So what Howdy does is it runs a little, a little website that just returns web service. It returns Howdy. And then I put some switches in it to slow it down and to speed it back up to mimic an overloaded server and then to show how the circuit breaker pattern works. So Howdy is, I'm going to publish it. All right. And so that compiles it. And then I will do a Docker build and then run it. Howdy. And while that's going, I'm going to go over here and show you that I have a Circuit Breaker console app. If I go into program.cs, there's a lot there, and I'll scroll back through it. We're over here, we're okay, we're still building. So this is the console app. It's not important that you see all the code and know, you know, everything that it's doing. Just notice that there's a timeout value of 200 milliseconds. Again, you would configure that, right? Um, in fact, in 12-factor apps, that would probably be, be a setting that would come from an environment variable. That would be a best practice. Um, you have four seconds, uh, four attempts rather, before it breaks, and it stays open for eight seconds. And then here's, if you know, if it's breaking for the circuit. If it's uh, if it's logging okay, if it's half open, you can see some of that in the code. All these policies are set, and here's where it's call calling the uh, it's calling Aloha. I, I remember earlier when I mentioned discovery. This is a perfect example of where you would benefit from that. I have to hard code this. Granted, I could do it from an environment variable, but I'm using an IP address and a port. That's you don't want to do that. You want to have, you know, URI right here. That's where, again, the OpenShift. I'm not running this in OpenShift, but if I was, I could just put that here, and I would never have to worry about it. So now I go back here. It's built Docker run, and I'm going to run it, and it runs on 5,000, as we saw. And it's how do you, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to give it a name just because it, it makes life easier. And when I mash this, it should start running. Oh, what did I do? Oh, I, my fingers. So now it's running in Docker. And I should be able to go over here. And that's this is vestigial from before. And if I type greeting, I should get howdy. Hey, there you go. So now I have it. Um, there's a really interesting dynamic that goes on here just out of programmer curiosity. When I go here and start to type, because Chrome, it does that forward fetching to improve performance. So as I start to type, it uses my history to know what I'm going to type and forward fetches. In other words, I have a, a, a a switch here I can use called slow down that slows down the service. And watch what happens. Watch my screen when I type S. Oh, you can't see it, but it'll it slows it down immediately. You can you'll see it when I go over here. So there's that. Get all that. That that we're done with that. Now we're going to go to the app. Yeah, circuit breaker app. This is where you'll see that. .NET run. Okay, so the console app is going to watch Howdy and I want port 5000 and report back. Okay, so it timed out and it failed. I don't know why that's failing. The application is running. I do know why it's failing. What I did, the mistake that I made, and this is important, 
is I'm running Howdy in Docker, and I don't want to do that because that remember I had the IP address of 10.1.2.2 in my code. That's not the IP address of my Docker container, is it? No, it's not. So if I Docker stop Howdy. So the point there is, again, without discovery, this that's a perfect example. Of like well, you can you can introduce problems and and mistakes, and they happen. So I stopped Howdy, and if I do a .NET run from the command line, now my other one will come to life. And I apologize, my my server is getting hammered. I should scale that back. Or my I, my uh, PC rather. So there it is running, and now over here. Okay, so here you can see what's happening. It's getting the request, howdy, and that's great. So now if I take that and, and slow it down, in the background, you'll see what will happen. Now it's failing, and it fails at times out, and then it goes into the circuit breaker, and that's where it's not even hitting the server. Now I'm going to purposely speed it back up, but I'm going to do it right after it shuts down it's going to do it you're going to see it go to half there it is and now normal no go to normal i want you to notice it doesn't immediately restore it in the background i'm waiting for it to get the half open it checks it fails now Ten dot one dot two five thousand slash normal. And something is happening with my uh there there we are. There's the greeting now. You had to have one demo god thing go wrong today. Yeah, everything else is so nice. Yeah. Well, that's odd. I've never seen that. Um, here it is. Let's see. Let's see the log. Everything's there. I can I can defeat the demo god by doing this. I can shut this down and remove the file slow down. Oh, it's restarting. Remove the file slow down, which is which is my little trick to get rid of the slowdown and and then run it at normal speed. So finally the circuit breaker closes. Um, this is actually a great demo of it because this whole time it's not been hitting the server. And when that comes back up, I should start seeing the howdies. And there it is. There's that. Well, make a liar out of me. Unless the, unless the uh, slowdown file is still there. No. Anyway, that's the, the theory of the circuit breaker. I've never had it fail on me, but uh, obviously I've done something wrong, and I apologize for that. To, oh, back to normal speed. There we go. Well, that was odd. There, and back to howdy. Well, go figure. So the idea is the circuit breaker keeps the client from hammering the server. Now, there was one other thing that I wanted to show you that's not in the slides. Is if you take a regular application and run it uh, regular, and not a microservice, just say like a website and run it in, uh, in OpenShift or Docker. And so I'll go to my shared. And I have a .NET on Linux. And over there is speaker. This is a little website that it's a keeps track of where you're going to speak at events. And I if I do a Docker build, I 
I should be able to build that. No, nope, it's not published yet. So the, the point I'm going to show you here is that you can take an existing website and just put it in Docker. Now this one, I mean, there, there are some things to consider. This one uses a SQLite database that's in the directory, uh, which is a terrible practice, right? Because in the container, you delete the container, you lose the database. You would typically be using a connection string to a database outside, you know, outside the uh, container, or you would use a persisted volume to make sure that you don't lose the data. So there's a Docker build, and, I, and, and if I did this right, it's going to sound funny. If I did this right when I run it, it won't work. <laughs> and you're going to be like, what's he talking about? Well, Docker run, and um, I hope I did this right so it crashes. And now nah, figures I did it right. The point I was trying to show you was that if I tried to run it on port 5000 and something was already there, it would crash. And again, that was just to underscore the idea that Kubernetes and uh, OpenShift work together to manage those things. When you run applications in Docker, you have, you have to assign a port, right? Port 80, whatever. If you try to run two of them in Docker on the same port, it won't work. It, they crash, they, they collide. But if you use Kubernetes, which OpenShift you know, uses as its tool, it manages that for you. So you can have multiple applications on the same port. I was hoping to show you it fail so I could underscore, but it, it succeeded. So so this is just a, a, a basic MVC website I created. Uh, and again, it writes to a SQL Lite database. So um, it, you know, it, it's just a throwaway. But the point of this is I'm, I just took an application um, that you maybe have a website and just threw it into Docker. I would. I would throw it into OpenShift and be able to scale it. The point is, even if you're not doing microservices, you still have this capability available to you. So that is everything I wanted to show you. There are some resources here. Uh, .NET and ASP.NET are on GitHub. This demo, all the code and all the instructions are Red Hat-.NET-MSA on GitHub. Um, there's some websites, redhatloves.net, that's ours. Dot.net is where you go for everything .net. Live.asp.net is, there's a weekly stand-up for .net uh, with Scott Hanselman, John Galloway, and Damian Edwards. It's, it's absolutely a must watch um, if you're gonna do anything with .net <clears throat> core. And then the, the Poly Project is the, the circuit breaker I showed you. That's the, the .net version, it's a very, mature and robust project and it's ongoing. Um, I really recommend that one. Uh, and then I'm available again on Twitter or email. And I encourage you to get your own zero cost Red Hat Enterprise Linux and or development suite at this URL and grab the GitHub repo for this presentation. And that's it for me. Do we have questions? There, well, there are a couple of them. I think you covered a lot of stuff there, so um, I'm, I'm expecting uh, you'll get a couple of emails. But so far, um, I, there was one question. I think you're running um, OpenShift uh, 3.3 or Origin 1.3. So, and someone was just asking if it also if it had to be on 1.4, and it doesn't. Um, everything works just fine on 1.3 Origin or 3.3, the paid OpenShift container version of it. And let's see, there was one other question, which I think Burr did a good answer. And what I might do is um, I'm going to unmute Burr if he wants to add anything here at the end and um, just say I'll hi. I'll stop sharing my screen. There you go. And there was one question very early on. Yeah. Hey, Don. The yes. question was related to what is the ideal style of .NET application to bring from the old world to this new world? Uh, you know, what would you say some of the limitations are in .NET Core versus .NET Framework, and what kind of apps are good to migrate over or apps? You know, good old .NET apps good for this new .NET. Right. That's a great question. If you have, uh, well, if you have a RESTful service, that's that's the right out of the, I mean, that's the one to do. That's like the best one. Um, an MVC website you could bring over. There's there's a lot involved in this. It's not a migration. It's a port or the other way around. I can't 
can remember how, which one it is, but it, it's not a lift and shift. There's some work involved. However, there are some tools available to analyze your code and show you what the scope of the work, basically. Um, Todd Mancini from Red Hat has written an excellent blog post about the effort of going from framework to core. And I know that um, outside of core, I know some people have had success using Mono and running that in OpenShift uh, to take a .NET Framework app and just basically almost lift it up and drop it into Mono. There's some minor things, very minor things necessary, um, some of which can, or I think they can all be automated with that click to cloud. Um, but a, number one would be a RESTful um, service. Two would be like an MVC website. Uh, if, if you have a SOAP, uh, oh my gosh, a web service, then you're going to have to run either run Mono or run it through. I don't know what you would. You'd have to use Mono because there's no there's no Windows communication framework in .NET Core. Yeah, no WCF, no web forms, no Win forms. No. Right. It's it's a limited subset, but it's a good subset. There's a lot of yes, possibilities here. So it's you know, and and a lot. There's a lot of fun things you can do. So we're we're looking forward to. It. I think maybe the um the stuff that you're mentioning about Todd's um migration tools might be something that's a good topic for a yeah. uh, future briefing um and demoing that and using moving stuff across um would be would be interesting at least to me um and uh, to see and uh, hopefully there's a few others. Um, Steve Spiker is one of our PMs that's on the call. Is there anything, Steve, if you want to unmute yourself, you can add in here. Um, this, this, there's lots of information um, out there. If you, uh, I'll look for Todd's uh, blog post and include it when I post this, um, this, this video that Don has done for us today. Um, the video will get posted on blog.openshift.com probably Monday or Tuesday next week, um, and it'll be on the YouTube channel. So it's, you know, you can watch it and slow down the pace and um, all the links will be there. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, this is Steve, um, this is a great demonstration. We try to uh, keep up with all the .NET Core uh, upgrades that are out there as well. And so uh, we showed a good way of demonstrating it offline in a localized uh, development suite or a container development kit. Uh, we also provide it hosted on our uh, developer preview instance of OpenShift Online, uh, which has .NET Core 1.1, um, and we would continue to try to you know keep pace as dot, the .NET Core updates occur, which kind of keep closing the gap between .NET. I don't know what you call it, legacy, but uh, prior to .NET Core, uh, keep adding more features. We we usually have almost uh, zero uh, wait time from the time it's released to the time it's actually available from Red Hat on our platform. So. It's terrific. Good way to experience it too. Yeah, next week, uh, the seventh. What is that? Tuesday. Microsoft is is dropping Visual Studio 2007, and the official, I believe, it's the official tooling 1.1 comes out then. I think I, I may be mistaken, um, but, but it related to that. I wrote a blog post. I think it was just last week about the the versions in .NET and some of the confusion that can be around it. It's a short blog post. It's real simple, but it's one of those things that if you don't know it. It gets really confusing. I mean, I've heard Scott Hanselman like, how come if I type this, I get this? And if I type you know, .NET, I get this. I type .NET dash version, I get this. So I talked to the guys at Microsoft and said, let me codify this and put it in writing so people understand. So if there is some confusion about versioning, um, go ahead and just find that blog post at redhatloves.net, and you'll, you'll understand it then. And it makes sense. Cool. So we can cross-post this um, in both places so that you can find it. So maybe we'll put this video up there and I'll, I'll, I'll find all those blog posts and add it with the video when it gets posted. Um, and we'll have you back again soon. You know, it sounds like there's more. Um, I know we're going to ask, uh, want Charlotte Elliott um, to come on and do some .NET, dot, um, ASP.NET um, demos as well, showing giving out some applications. She's a, a new developer evangelist with the OpenShift team and comes from the gaming industry. So I'm, Curious to see what her demos look like. They're probably a lot cooler than mine and even your little speaker thing. So, um, and probably a little bit more complex. So this has been really good. I'm really pleased that the demo gods were with us today, Don. Um, and if you have anything, um, if anyone else is on the call and is listening to this, 
there's any other aspect of .NET or running um, Microsoft stuff, um, just reach out to me and let me know. Um, you can find me at, at OpenShift Common um, on Twitter um, or at Python DJ, um, which is my rant and rave channel. Um, and also, if you're not on the OpenShift Common mailing list yet, drop me a note at dmueller at redhat.com. That's D-M-U-E-L-L-E-R at redhat.com, and you'll get um, added to our mailing list, so you'll get announcements of all of these briefings and upcoming events. Also, a lot of us will be in Berlin on March 28th for, um, and 29th and 30th for KubeCon, um, and I'm hosting a one-day OpenShift gathering um, at the same location um, the day before KubeCon, so if you'd like to join us for that, um, we'll have a meetup of all the .NET Microsofty folks um, will have their own lunch table to eat together. Not because we're trying to segregate you guys, but um, you should have seen, Don, there was a little going back and forth. Burr handled it nicely about, you know, this is uh, uh, .NET Core is just like Node.js and Vertex, and I refrain from doing any hipster jokes. But, um, yeah, uh, so you know, we'll, we'll let you mix and mingle in, at the gathering. There'll be a gathering in Berlin in March. There'll be another one at um, the day before Summit in Boston and another one um, the day before KubeCon in Austin, the North, North American one in December. So um, lots of opportunities. Um, there are SIG groups at the OpenShift Commons, so please do take a peek at commons.openshift.org. Um, and um, join up on the SIG that you like, and I'll add you to any mailing lists that you want, because everybody loves to have all those mailing lists. Without any further ado, thank you again, Don, Burr, Steve, and everyone who asked questions. Um, it was a great demo, and I'm really pleased to have appeased the demo gods finally. So thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you.